chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I sure thank God for the many results of the election on Tuesday. But I fear American hearts are misplacing their hope. And I am going to pour my heart a little bit out tonight on, on a, a problem that I can uh, see with our country, but mostly uh, with our church. And I want to pour it out, um, not in a condemning way. Uh, I want to put myself sitting in the same seats uh, as we all sit in. And uh, this is just something, a plea uh, for the state of Christianity, a plea for a direction maybe that our church could head. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm very thankful for a lot that happened on Tuesday, but, um, but I, I fear that it can fill our hearts with a misplaced hope. I, I thank God for the interference that will be placed on the abortion slaughter, but I fear the complacency that will follow our surface-level token efforts. I, my heart is full of gratefulness to God for the drug trafficking that will be choked, but I fear we will continue to ignore the urgency to reach kids and teenagers into Sunday school. My heart is full of gratefulness to God for the potential stop of the horrific wars across the seas, but I fear a confidence in a man's leadership will suppress our prayers for God's mercy and protection over the innocent. My heart is full of gratefulness to God for the potential economy reversal, but I fear American hearts only want to say, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. My heart is full of gratefulness to God for the potential exposure of evil men, but I fear the self-righteousness that will follow. My heart is full of gratefulness to God for the freedom that will be extended, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty like the Bible talks about. But I fear we will content ourselves in the peace and quiet and ignore the true purpose to live godly and share the gospel in honesty. My heart is full of gratefulness to God for his mercy on our country this week. But I fear Christian American hearts are full of, self, of false confidence. Christian American hearts are full of pride in our Sunday rallies and campaign organization. Christian American hearts are full of the joy and the success of our voting and our choices. Our hearts are full of conservative values, but we have cast aside the source of judgments and statutes that gave them value. Our hearts are full of wealth, yet we hunger for a confident path to more riches. Our hearts are even full of lip service to thank the Lord, but it is only to gain the esteem of others by displaying a facade of humility. Our hearts are full of the right way in our eyes, but we are ignoring what God calls my ways. Our hearts are full of the way of self-pleasure, but we have forgotten the need of self-denial. Our hearts are full of self-preservation, but we have stopped our ears at the biblical invitation of self-sacrifice. My plea with you tonight, with us, with myself included, is that our hearts are full, but our altars are empty. Look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. We'll start with. Verse 11. It says, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, oh Lord, I come before you tonight, and I pray, Lord, that you challenge us to not be a Christianity that is so full of what we would even consider good things that we neglect to sacrifice the things that are taking precedent over your will in our life. And Lord, I pray that we consider ourselves and consider what we can do for our lives but also for our children's lives and for the future of this country's life 
And Lord, I pray that you uh, provoke us tonight, and I pray that you challenge us like only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would look at verse 5, look at verse 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. This, whole, this chapter is all a warning of getting into the promised land and getting to the state of fullness. When they are so full of the blessing of God that they neglect the God of the blessing. And in verse 5, it says, That thou also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Now, the interesting part about that verse right there and the verse is talking about fullness is it's actually a cross-reference. It is also a, a, a um, it, it is referred to again in our day. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 gives a parallel passage to this exact situation. And the church that is being addr addressed in this exact same situation is what some would say is the church of our day, the church of Laodicea. It says in, in verse 14, and unto the angel of the, of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the amen and the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I love those names for Jesus. Um, it says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, and I would that thou wert cold or hot. Um, but if you look at, at verse 19, um, it, says, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That is the, almost exactly what it said in Deuteronomy 8. And then it says uh, in verse 17, it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This is a terrible state of the church of the last days. It is this position of becoming full and having full hearts and neglecting the God who gave us this fullness. I want to illustrate it tonight. I got a basket right here that is going to represent our heart. All right, represent our heart. And I'm talking tonight, I'm not just talking about worldliness. I'm not just talking about the things, the cares of this world, but I'm talking about in our heart, um, we are full of just stuff. We are full of stuff. I mean, we all have, um, not every, we, we've got marriages to take care of, right? And it fills, so it begins to fill our hearts. We've got kids that we've got to take care of that fill our heart. We've got a job that we've got to work that fill our heart. Um, we've got a house that we have to uh, pay for and we have to take care of and it fills our heart. Um, we've got to, to maintain some Bible reading, and it fills our heart. We've got to have prayer time, and, uh, and that, that's filling our heart. We've got to have a ministry of some kind, right? And those, that ministry is filling our heart. We've got, we pursue happiness. We're looking for happiness, and oftentimes it's in the wrong places, uh, outside of the will of God. But, but happiness the search for happiness can fill our hearts. We could be searching for success, and as we fall asleep at night, we're just thinking about how can we become more successful um, in our jobs, and even just in the good things with our family, and, and all of these things that are just filling our heart, even with the goodness of the Lord. But we also can fill our hearts just with things like exercise and fitness and, and diet plans and, and, uh, and going, going beyond just basic health things. And, and uh, we could be filling our hearts with the, uh, the, the search for adventure, the things that make us excited about going on, on this uh, vacation or, or this, this, uh, this adventure. And I'm not talking about bad things necessarily tonight. I'm talking about just things that that fill our hearts. Uh, we could be looking just for security, security for our homes, maybe just through financial security, on, on, on earning enough money to be uh, financially uh, secure, maybe physical security, just uh, taking care of, uh, we're constantly thinking about how can we be physically secure, uh, maybe internal security, and we're, we're concerned about uh, the look of our nose and our eyebrows and, you know, things that will make us internally secure, right? And we're just filling our heart with stuff, right? We're pursuing wealth. We're pursuing fun. We're pursuing modern looks in our homes. 
uh, pursuing, you know, the updated kitchens and, and all of the extra stuff. We're pursuing the latest technology and we're pursuing new cars and we're pursuing um, uh, s a success in sports and maybe sports for our children and getting them in, uh, in different leagues and different, different things. I got more. Here we go. I got more. Um, we've got... Uh, we, uh, we've got um, uh, pursuing just movies, right? Uh, 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 keeping up uh, with movies that fulfill our time. Media consumption. And some of these are a problem, and some of these are, are just kind of basics. But the, the whole point is that these are filling our heart. Uh, media consumption is the constant doom scrolling uh, that just, I believe, it within the last couple years has become so detrimental to the Christian's heart. It is a drug that we did not see coming or that we ignored the warnings on. And it's something that seemed good for a long time, but the, the, the fangs are set in and the poison is pumping. And, and, uh, and, and I've, I've found myself in this situation just with the, the, the small uh, access that I have. And I'm like, what am I doing? This is ridiculous of what this is doing to our lives. But that, that's a side point, right? Um, uh, maybe it's a, a, a prejudice to um, a, a, a mindset or a mentality to how you were raised and you're full of a, maybe a philosophy of, of uh, what you think is right. Um, maybe, you're, uh, maybe you've got some unforgiveness tonight. Um, uh, something that's filling your heart. Uh, maybe just knowledge. You're just you're a smart person pursuing knowledge and you've got a lot that you know and, uh, and the preaching happens and you're constantly comparing it to the knowledge or the experience that you've had. And so the, maybe the way you were raised or whatever it be. And, and, uh, and, and uh, maybe it's just it's, it's your logic, your philosophy. There's so many things that fill up our hearts. And then God says, hey, I've got a new serving opportunity for you. And I'd like for you to do it. And he puts it in your heart there's no room for it. He says, I, I, I want to give you more of a desire for eternal things, but there's no room. He says, I, I want to uh, give you a bus route to help, or bus captain, or drive, but there's just, there's no time. There's no room. There's no room in my heart. I've got a Sunday school class for you to have, but there's no room. I've got a, a missionary that needs some prayer right now, but there's no room. I've got, I've got an answer for a burden for you today in your Bible reading, but there's just no room. And I'm not talking today necessarily about evil things in our hearts, which, if, which I, I am also talking about that. But I'm just talking about this state of being, having our heart so full of the things that we can fit the things that, that make sense and the things that we need within our heart. And God is trying to put things into our heart through the preaching and through the Holy Spirit. And, but our heart is too full to accept anything else. And so we show up on Sunday and we listen to the preaching and we walk out those doors and nothing has changed because there's no room. One of my favorite verses that I sign my name with is Psalm 62.8. It says, trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge to us, Selah. When Hannah, when Hannah was found outside the door of the tabernacle, Eli, he thought that she was drunk because she was just crying and weeping over a, of, a, of a burden. And she said, no, my Lord. Or she said, no, my Lord. Uh, I'm just a woman of sorrowful spirit. Um, I have not drink wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. What you and I need today is a pouring out of our hearts before the Lord. We need to come before God, and we need to be willing to pour out our hearts before him, and in many cases, make some sacrifices within our heart in order to create room for God's will in our life to be fulfilled. There's got to be a pouring out, but pouring out, it takes cost. When we look at our, we like what's in our heart. Right now, there's a reason for every single thing within our heart. But I guarantee that if we were to come before God tonight and say, God, my heart is full, what, what can I do? 
to accept a little bit more? What can I do to accept what you, what you want in my life? And God is going to, if you have a heart that's tender and a heart that is willing, God is going to put his finger right on the button. And you're going to have the choice of whether or not you're willing to sacrifice that spot or if you're going to just ignore it and keep it in there. Pouring out takes cost. That's why the example is given in John chapter 12 of Mary as she uh, took a pound of ointment of spikenard. The Bible says very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus. Very costly. This is why David, when the, the, the death angel was coming and destroying the people of his land, and he came to, uh, to the land of Ornan, and, and Ornan offered to give it to him for free, and he said these words. He said, I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. There has to be cost uh, involved in sacrifice. There is cost involved in pouring out our hearts. And we, we, we have to do this because sacrifice hurts. Sacrifice hurts. It costs and it hurts and it does hurt, especially if we are focused on the sacrifice over what it gains, right? When we take our kids to the dentist, the, the, their focus is only on the sacrifice. They can't understand what it gains, they can't understand that this pain of this shot is there to gain something. The pain of, of this problem is there to gain something, right? Sacrifice hurts, pouring out costs. But the Bible says in Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is why Galatians 5, 24 says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions thereof. Sacrifice is a major part of the Christian life. In fact, it's our reasonable service. All throughout the Bible, uh, starting with Adam and Eve, there are illustrations of the, the need for sacrifice. And thank God, we no longer have to sacrifice to atone for our sins. The debt's been paid. But the purpose of sacrifice throughout the Bible is not all just about ritual. Um, it's, it's not all about uh, those sacrifices, but it's about our heart. Psalms 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. Matthew 15, 8 says, This people drieth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. But now because we are free from the bondage of sin, God asks us to crucify or sacrifice the affections and lusts of our flesh, those things that fill up our heart. He asks us to sacrifice earthly pleasures. He asks us to sacrifice time. He asks us to sacrifice energy. He asks us to sacrifice desires. He asks us to sacrifice dreams and goals and pursuits. He asks us to sacrifice things in the name of pursuing his will. But the problem tonight is we are so full in our heart that we are not willing to make sacrifices and the altar remains empty in our life. Not Sacrificing uh, these things will not take us to heaven or make us good people. Uh, no, sacrifice, because it, it, will not, it will not make God love us more or make us more accepted by him. Um, but, but because it will allow us to show some kind of love back to him after all he has done for us. My sacrifices cannot make him love me more than he already does. Because whether I'm in a far country wasting my life with riotous living or eating the pig slop after my stupid decisions or running back into his open arms, his love never changes. But the more that I conse consecrate my heart cut off the strings of influence from the world and separate myself from these temporary sinful temptations and, and cleanse myself from this filthy flesh or crucify and or sacrifice the affection, affections and lusts of my flesh, the closer, the closer I become to the image of Christ and the more God can be a father to me. My illustration that I believe I've shared before, but is when Kenny has a dirty diaper, it does not make me love him less. It only makes fellowship more difficult. 
right? I love that kid, right? I'm so thankful for my boy. Uh, but I don't love just hanging out with him with a dirty diaper. There's got to be a change. There's got, he's got to sacrifice his comfortable position and his comfortable state. They never want their diaper changed. They're just happy. I don't it, uh, Ephesians 5, 5, 2, it says, And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us in offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Just like Christ gave himself as an offering and sacrifice, we are supposed to walk in that kind of love. A love for Christ, but then a love for others. A sacrificial life. We have got to have an altar we have got to have an altar with a sacrifice. Now, I, I hesitate only because I don't feel like I, I am in the position to call, to, to plea for this. But I'm, I'm going to plea. We have something at the end of each service called an altar call. And there is a purpose for it. And, and I, I, I've gotten to grow up with the purpose and understanding the purpose for it but i believe that it has been slipping in american christianity it's it's we, we've been did a whole month on fundamentalism but the altar call and the invitation is a part of fundamental christianity it, it it's 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 no it's it's not in the, in the book of acts it doesn't say anything about them having altar calls it doesn't say anything like that. But let, let, me, let me just, what is, what is an altar call, right? Um, uh, an altar call is an invitation. It's an invitation for those who are unsaved to get saved and then for those who are saved to make a sacrifice. You can make a sacrifice not at the front of the auditorium. That is true. You absolutely can. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only way to, to make sacrifices between you and God. But let me just, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't, if you've kind of lost sight of what this is all about, if you've kind of, or if you just have never known uh, what it's all about, um, the altar call is an invitation. It is, a, it is a call to an invite, not that has to be accepted by everybody, but an invite to come and make a step forward a step away uh, kind of that that is the first part of the sacrifice that you're making it's that step of uncomfortableness out of your position uh, uh, forward and away in a public way um, to come down and to talk to God I, when when I, when I'm at the altar and when I'm at the uh, 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 at the invitation um, I, I'm, I'm there because I want God to work on my heart if he has not already worked on my heart in the preaching. Um, let me say, why do, why do I move in response to the invitation? Um, number one is because I need to make a sacrifice. And walking down the aisle starts the process. And you could say, well, it's just for show. And it, it shouldn't be. But the logic doesn't hold because every sacrifice in the Bible was a public ordeal. And the, the reasons for the sacrifice was internal. That wasn't public, but the sacrifice was. It was a sacrifice. And you know, my children need to see humble dad on his knees before the Lord making a sacrifice. I, I've already said, it, it's not, I'm not condemning and saying that if you don't do it here, you're not doing it, all right? I'm just saying that is the purpose of this altar. That is the purpose. No, there's no, there is no altar here. Right? We're talking about spiritual sacrifices, internal sacrifices that happen on the inside between us and God. You know, it, it, it's a tradition. Um, but, but 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught. You know, when you've got a Bible tradition, a bi biblical purpose for a tradition that doesn't con contradict things in the Bible, hey, if it's a tradition that's been taught, let's hold it fast. And I'm here tonight to plead that we could hold fast the tradition of the altar. 
Because the, uh, the, the issue that we're having across Christianity is that we have full hearts, good intentions, uh, uh, full Christian hearts, right, of doing good things. Not necessarily bad, but the bad is definitely creeping in. We got these full hearts, and there is no sacrifice happening. And so my call is maybe this would be a great start. The altar. Why do I move in response to the invitation? Number one, because I need to make a sacrifice, and I need to make a sacrifice every service myself. You might be better than I am, uh, but I am. I am rotten, and every service speaks to me. But number two, number two, sometimes when it doesn't, my number two reason to come down and respond to the invitation is I missed whatever it was I was supposed to sacrifice. Because I, I missed it. I was, it was a long day at or a long week at work or, or a rough night with a baby screaming all night or whatever the case would be, right? And I missed it. And so, oh God, we made it to the end of the invitation. Uh, confession time, right? Uh, I probably shouldn't do this, but uh, you know, at the end of, um, of Lord's Supper, if G G Pastor Roy says, now if you haven't told the Lord you love him yet, now would be a good time. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I've been, oh God, I love you, you know. It's, oh, I missed it, all right. Um, uh, right, it's, it's we, need, we need an altar to be reminded and that physical reminder, no, it's not necessary, but my call is that it is important. I got to live, I got to grow up with a, a mom and dad who believed that the altar was important. And I got to see a humble father kneel before the Lord. And I didn't know what sacrifices he was making, but I never doubted that my dad cared about obeying the Lord every time he spanked me for not obeying the Lord. Right? I knew that, hey, my dad isn't just all words. He, he means it in his own personal life as well. I need to make a sacrifice, number one reason. Number two is I missed whatever was supposed to sa was, was I was supposed to sacrifice. Number three, I need to break the ice for the unsaved or newer Christians. When, when the invitation gets put out there for anyone who's not saved to come forward and to talk to one of the, 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 the men up here or the ladies up here who are ready to give the gospel to them, when they are asked to come forward in our, our, in our day. I mean, yes, if, if the Lord's working on him, he can get them out of, out of the altar but, or out of, out of their pew. But I tell you what, when nobody is moving and they have to walk down this aisle by themselves, the flesh will often win. And they may walk out of this church unsaved and go to hell because there was not a, a natural invitation for them to walk down with. There was not a flow already happening. I, 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 I'll, my number three reason is I come to the altar because I want to break the ice for the unsaved or the newer Christian who the Lord is working on their heart and they don't quite understand the whole concept of the altar. Uh, they don't quite understand how to get that right. But, but man, when they, see, when they see a church just flood the altar, it, it makes a difference. It, it, it sets a fire on the church. That's what the altar is. You come to the altar and you let the Lord set the fire and ablaze your sacrifice. And when a church like this gets ablaze like that, it's an alive church. It's a church that's ready to go out and be a living sacrifice. We've got to, we've got to be people of the altar, both internally at our homes, but I would plea at church as well. Um, number four reason is I need my children, and I kind of already addressed this, I need my children to see a humble, obedient father. Sunday school teacher, maybe you need your, your Sunday school kids to see a humble and obedient teacher. It's, nobody, nobody needs to know what's going on in your heart between you and the Lord, but I hope something's going on. Yes, you can make an altar out of your pew. Absolutely. You can make an altar just by standing there. But my plea my plea is that, that if that's all we ever did, then we would backslide so fast. It's because it is more comfortable, let's just be honest. It's more comfortable to not move anywhere. It's more comfortable. And so my plea is that we reignite the flame of the altar at church. That's not the whole point of my sermon, but, but uh, we need the altar. We have full hearts. We have good intentions. 
but we, need, we cannot have an empty altar. We've got to be willing to make sacrifices. And the invitation, the purpose of the invitation is to give us an opportunity to come before the Lord and say, God, this is a mess and I need your help. Uh, and, and you may say, um, you may say, I, I, lost, I lost my notes on this part, but you may say, well, I, I, I come to the altar and I give up the same thing every time. Right? I give it up every time. So, so I'm just not going to come and keep making that sacrifice because I, I, I feel like every time I come to the altar, the Lord is putting his finger on the same exact thing, and I'm giving up every time, and I'm such a hypocrite, and I'm not going to go do it again. Right? And so that would be like saying, okay, my house, yeah, uh, I cleaned my house. But it's going to get dirty again, so I'm just going to stop cleaning my house, right? I put on deodorant before, and, but I, I just keep uh, getting stinky again, so I'm not going to put deodorant on again, right? Uh, I, I, I mowed my lawns before, but it just keeps growing, and so I'm not going to mow it again, right? The, the logic does not stand. The, that logic is from the devil. That logic is, is the devil telling us that he is not faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That logic is... Is trying to steer us away from the, the daily need to make a sacrifice. We've got to be people of sacrifice. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 20, 22. Joshua chapter 22. In this story, um, the, the promised land had been given. And Joshua and the Israelites have gone all the way through the promised land. And they have uh, conquered it. They have won the victories and God has given them the victory. And it was now time for the tribe of Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh to go back to their land. Let me, let me explain just real quick. Um, in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy, the, the children of Israel broken up into to the 12 tribes, right? And they were going into the land, and they was all going to be divided by tribe um, to all have their land of inheritance. But the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they were, they were on the east side of Jordan, and they saw that the land was, was good for their cattle. It was a good land. And God had delivered the people who dwelt in that land into the hand of the Israelites. And this, these tribes, they said to Moses, they said, can we, can we just settle our people here? And, and Moses said, no way. He says, you, you, you can't settle your people here and let the rest of us go into Canaan to go across the Jordan to fight those battles. That, that, that's the same attitude uh, that the people had when they were first offered the promised land. The same attitude of, of no, we don't want to go into there. And Moses said, no way, you can't do that. And so they came back with a proposal and they said, all right, if we stay, can we, can we build our cities on the east side of Jordan, um, but can the, all the men of war go over Jordan and fight the conquest until it is finished and then once it's over then our men of war can go back uh, to the cities that we built and so they built up fence cities and they built up uh, they built out their land for their children and their women and and they built this land they went into the promised land and they went through and conquered the land and now it was time for the warriors who came to help the children of Israel to go back to their homes it was it, it, they had done everything the right way I would argue um, uh, that they weren't in God's perfect will. That God's perfect will was for them to end up on the west side of Jordan. But, but God accepted the terms. And oftentimes we can wrestle God into our terms and not end up in God's perfect will for our life. And God will allow it because he's a just God. But the story comes in when, when they're heading back over the Jordan to their land and the rest of the Israelites are settling in the promised land. And as they, as they go over there, look down with me at verse um, 10. It says, And when they came unto the borders of Jordan, 
that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. A great altar they built to see to. And the children of Israel on the west side of Jordan said, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half tribe of Manasseh, have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan um, and at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. A civil war was about to begin. Because the law had been expressly stated that the altar was at the tabernacle in Shiloh. This is where the altar was built. This is where the sacrifices take place, was at Shiloh, at the place that God designed. And the children of Israel, they send uh, Reuben and Gad and Manasseh back, and then they hear word that they're building an additional altar at the, at the, the river Jordan. What in the world? God's going to destroy us. At this time, the children of Israel had been so engulfed in God's miracles that they feared the Lord. And they said, uh-uh, we are going to gather our troops. We are going to gather together. And they all rallied together at Shiloh. And they were marching against their brothers to clean house. But before they got there, they sent, they sent some emissaries before them. Ten princes and one man named Phineas. Phineas, the son of Eliezer. He was the one who, when Balak, con, uh, co, 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 Balaam convinced Balak uh, to, to tempt the children of Israel with the adultery uh, 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 of, that, of Peor, and, and the children of Israel fell for it, and God slew 24,000 in that plague. Well, Phineas, while he was praying at the altar before the Lord, saw a sin and raised up his javelin and went over and he killed, he killed the sin. And, and he is now, years down the road, he is sent as the leader of this group of princes to go represent Israel and say to these backsliders, to say to them, what are you doing? And to send the message that they have done, they've messed up. And, uh, Look at verse 16. And he said, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord, and that ye have builded you an altar, that ye may rebel this day against the Lord? In this, is, is the iniquity of Peor too little for us? What a great question. But ye turn away, verse 18, this day from following the Lord, uh, and, and he's, he starts chewing them out. He's chewing them out. And then they give an answer. They give an answer and they say this. They say, the Lord God of gods is the Lord God of gods. He knoweth, and Israel, he shall know if it be a rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord. Save us not this day. They start pleading with Phineas and the princes. Say, oh no, that is not what we intended. We did not intend, and, and the Lord knows our hearts, and save us not this day. Come and fight, destroy us this day. If we have set this altar up in rebellion to the Lord. It's getting a little confusing. They're setting this altar. The Bible says it's a great altar, a a replica altar of the one in Shiloh. This altar was bigger. This altar was more to look at. This altar was, was more of a wow factor to them. And, and Phineas is asking, what are you doing? And they're saying, it's not in rebellion. The purpose of us building this altar is uh, looked down in, in verse 26. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar. Oh, wait, no, go back, go back. Uh, verse 24, and if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, for fear of rebellion, saying in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, 
Ye children of Reuben and children of Gad, we have no part, ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore, we said, let us now prepare to build an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you. What a great intention. They had this altar built. They said, because we don't want down the road your children to say to our children that we have no part together. Because God put a border between Jordan. And so we are going to set this altar up. It is going to have no sacrifice. It is only going to be for a memorial. It is only going to be a replica of what the real altar is. It is only going to be for looks for that way our children can see it. And our children can know we have part with you. The, the children, the tribe of, Je, of, of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh had great intentions. Their hearts were full. In fact, you could even argue zealous for the Lord. They had just conquered uh, through Canaan. They had just done all kinds of things, and, and maybe their heart was right. I'll give them credit. Their heart was right. It was logical. It made sense to them. The problem was is that it was sending them down a direction that was away from the Lord. Because let me ask the question, why would their children not believe that their children were a part of the Lord's inheritance if their children continued the sacrifices at Shiloh? What, 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 what would be the conflict? If the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh were constantly making the trips, constantly making the effort to go down to Shiloh to make their sacrifices, then where would the disunity come from? But they set up an altar so that they could make sure everybody knew that they looked like God's people. That they were a part of God's people. See, we've got an altar. But the problem with their altar is it was an empty altar. It was an altar that was just for looks. It is what is going to happen. It's a directional thing. When we just associate ourselves with the church. And we just associate ourselves with the altar. And we just associate ourselves with the sacrifices. Our kids, they grow up with merely an association. And when it's time for them to go make their sacrifices, they say, hey, we've got an association. And if you follow the tribes of, 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 of Israel and the tribes of, of Gad and Reuben, Reuben and Manasseh, it turns into idolatry real fast. I don't think it even made it past the children's generation. Because they set up an empty altar to represent their loyalty to the Lord. And I fear that our church today, we are so full of good intentions and we are so full of, 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 of doing right, so full of maybe our own philosophies of, 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 of just child rearing and ministry involvement and giving and we're, we're so full of, of how we can just, uh, you know, uh, be, make church just a part of our life enough to associate ourselves with the with 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 God and maybe our parent maybe our kids will just magically make it maybe our kids even though we're not making the trip to Sh Shiloh even though we're not making the sacrifices maybe our children will just magically uh, make the trip themselves when they get a little older and it does not happen if your children will not see you making that trip to Shiloh to make the sacrifices, the things that hurt, the things that, 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 that give up an area of your life that you love, something maybe even that, that you think is good, something that you think has value. If the Holy Spirit is putting your heart on it, it's got to be sacrificed. And your kids need to know that you are sacrificing you can claim it's all internal, and you can claim that you've got a, a real good walk with God and all that type of stuff, but I'm, I'm making a plea for an external show of a sacrifice to at least your family. 
They got to know because how is the, our children's generation going to make any sacrifices if they do not see us doing it? It's the curse of the empty altar. There is nothing that was wrong with the empty altar. In fact, the Phineas and the princes and the whole rest of Israel, they, the Bible says they were at peace with the answer. Oh, good. Oh, good. I'm so glad you didn't do it in rebellion. Oh, good. And they went back home. There was no civil war. We, you and I, have the advantage of hindsight. We get to look back and say, oh, yeah, the answer of just associating with God's people, it was a good enough answer because we, we're, not, we're not really supposed to judge each other. And so, so, yeah, we can accept that answer. But my plea with you tonight is it is a dangerous direction. It is a dangerous direction when we have altars in our life with no sacrifice. We've got to get to the altar of sacrifice, which takes us getting out of our comfort zone. And it takes us uh, going, going to the Lord and saying, Lord, number one, I've got some sacrifices to do. And then number two, I need, I need my children to know that I'm making sacrifices. The danger, I believe, with the church of today and the danger, I, and I hate, to, I hate to even say it with our church because our church is such a sacrificial church. Um, but if I could just say, in fear of it becoming an empty altar, can we all decide tonight that we are going to make a real altar and some real sacrifices in our life? And I, I almost don't even want to do an invitation tonight because that's, that's not, that's, my goal is not for you to respond to my message. My, my goal tonight is just to re-exalt the purpose of this thing. It's a big deal. It is not, it is not... Uh, necessary. There's nothing wrong with not coming down to the altar. There's nothing wrong uh, with that. There is something wrong with not making sacrifices. There is something wrong with that. And if you can, if the, if the Lord can point out maybe a direction in your home that is going to affect your children because they don't see your sacrifices in, in your movie library, our, I should say our, in our movie library, in our music choices, in our priority choices on what's more important, if they don't see those sacrifices happening, then they ain't going to Shiloh when they get older. They won't. It doesn't work that way. The only reason anyone who grew up in church and is still here today it's because they saw a whole lot of genuine sacrifice and saw how real it was, how real the fire of God was that came and consumed those sacrifices, how real the blessing was that followed all of it. We've got to be a church of sacrifice. It's not for salvation. No, this doesn't please, this doesn't make God love us more. It just will help us get closer to him. It's to present our bodies a living sacrifice. It's to crucify the flesh and the affections and lusts. This is our call as Christians, to show a little bit of love. Oh, it's a pathetic little bit of love. Back to the one who sacrificed so much for us. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to come.